Good evening, everyone. The hour is seven. Seven is the hour. Our last time together for this spring session. So, does anyone have any burning questions before we sit down and have our last class? No burning questions? Okay. Maybe later. Okay. Well, as we begin all things, we begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the traditional prayer used during Pentecost and the rest of the year, invoking the inspiration and presence of the Holy Spirit. So you should all be very familiar with the prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who with the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the gift of the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel selections for tonight should be, the first one should be very, very familiar to you. It's the one that we read on Divine Mercy Sunday, where Jesus appears to the apostles in the upper room, and John notices, or makes notice, that Thomas is not with them, and then a week later, Jesus appears, and Thomas is with them, and we have this whole conversation between Jesus and Thomas. As we've figured out several times now, God does not waste ink. Every word in Scripture means something. We may not exactly know what it means at the given time or have the exact mindset that the original evangelist may have had 2,000 and some years ago, or going back even further to David when he wrote the Psalms that are attributed to his hand or even further back to Moses when he wrote. So having these texts available to us as 21st century North Americans living in Western New York State, it's a different mindset, a different mentality than 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. And well, none of us are Middle Eastern as far as I know. So the cultural uh, situation in the time of Jesus and before David's time, Moses' time, was much, much different than our own. And we make this uh, assumption, I guess, of projecting our mentality, our psychology, on things and people of the time of Jesus and the time of the other people that we read about in, in the Bible. And that's a mistake because we fail to see those texts for what they really are. If we believe that they were inspired word of God, they speak to all times and places, yes, but they do have a very concrete, very physical um, connection to the actual events that they're recording. And we sometimes don't understand them or we miss up on them because we're not of that culture. We're not of that time and place. So, in doing my reading for tonight, I delved a little bit more into what was John thinking when he wrote what he wrote? What was John's background for what he wrote? Of course, John knew of the other evangelists' writings to a certain degree. He also knew, of course, the Old Testament. So he uses a lot of stuff in the Old Testament to, in a sense, irrigate and illuminate his writings in the New Testament to give them fresh water and fresh eyes. So I hope that becomes apparent as we get to the text. Well, before we get to John, I thought I'd share with you same St. Paul. This is similar to last Tuesday when we had the letter from the Colossians. 
This is a letter to the Philippians. The last part of this uh, lection from Paul's letter to the Philippians is the second reading on Palm Sunday. So it may be familiar to you from a few weeks ago. So this is St. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, a town, actually city, in Greece. The second chapter, verses 2 through 11. Paul wrote, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, Pentecost is coming, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each one look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped at, but rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, having been born in human likeness and being found human in form. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. It's another one of those, um, the technical, technical term is Christological hymns. There are some theory that Paul borrowed it from another source and just punched in the line about dying on the cross. If you know anything about Greco-Roman mythology, which was predominant in the area where Paul was preaching, especially in Greece, there were gods doing all kinds of things. Gods who were being born, gods who were being killed, gods who were being raised from the dead. So Paul confronted this. He adapted a hymn, a song, a chant, that he may have heard in the temples in Greece, and he somehow used his own imagination and the gift of the Holy Spirit to take this text and rework it and apply it to Jesus. And in his application of it to Jesus, all he had to do, apparently, was plug in that line about dying on the cross. There's a little bit more there to it than that. I think Paul, as an author, was not terribly poetic most times, but he does have occasional really sharp poems, like the one in Corinthians about love, love is patient, love is kind. This is similar to that. It's a description of the emptying out of Jesus. The technical word for that is kenosis. It means to empty out. But usually you think a pitcher, you dump it, or a plate of cookies, and you toss it over. That's emptying out. That's the kenosis that Paul is referring to here with Jesus. He literally empties himself out of his divinity in order to become human. And he becomes human to save us from everything that is not us. Because evil is not us. God made us good in his image and likeness. So anything that's not of us, is not of God, is not good, that had to be taken away. That had to be emptied out as well. And how the emptying takes place is by the emptying of God in the person of Christ.
to the, the connection, the correlation between the two. And I think Paul, he's not writing this for the sake of writing a beautiful poem. It's not a hallmark card to Jesus, say, oh, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. It's much, much deeper than that. It's a way of explaining, expressing to the Philippians who are Greeks, who are very philosophical, who are very urbane, very cultured, saying, this is the Jesus who I am proclaiming to you. You have other gods, but my God has done this. None of your gods have done this, but mine has. So I think he's really trying to get across the expression, the man who came, the the, the God who became the form of man in the person of Jesus who was crucified and exalted at God's right hand. He is the God to whom I owe my allegiance and to whom I get you, I want you to owe your allegiance to as well. Does that make sense? Okay. So, Philippians chapter 2. Okay. Moving on to John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31. This is the gospel for the second Sunday of Easter or Divine Mercy Sunday. The second gospel is the gospel for the vigil of Pentecost, which should be actually earlier than this gospel, but we'll get to that a little later on. So John 20, 19 to 31. Jesus appears to the disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The purpose of this book author's note. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Any questions just about the text? Yes. Um, isn't there a part at the end that says, if you, if you don't doubt everything you have enough books in the world, where, where is that? That was sort of, that was it. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's a different translation. Oh, okay. Yeah, all the world can't contain the stories. Yeah. At the very end, basically saying that all the world can come to 
Yeah, all the world cannot contain, yeah. It's like there's so much that he did and said that we probably couldn't fathom it all. And even Jesus says during the Last Supper in the discourse of uh, the high priestly prayer in John, you know, there's more I can tell you, but you're too sad now to understand it. You're too, you know, weary with these things. I can give you more and more. We can be here all night talking, but we have things to do. But yeah, the text is, there's so much more that this book could cover, but what you have so far is enough for you to believe. Yeah, because it's too much of a good thing is, you know, maybe detrimental in a sense. Yes? I once read or heard a reflection on John and Thomas. Mm -hmm. I found very intriguing. According to uh, tradition, he went and preached in India. Yes. And they said his very personality, that hard edge, like in Missouri Shoulders, hmm. helped him with the, the Hindu and the Buddhist cultures. You know, they had vagueness, they had dreaminess, they had thrown to the void of faithfulness. Thoughts yeah. Helped him I think so. I mean, like the other apostles, <clears throat> he, he, he went out to the known world. His uh, was his strength. His was, after he had the experience of the risen Christ, he, somehow he needed that for his own personal well-being, his own personal salvation. And once having had that experience of touching the true physical body of the risen Christ, he was able to go out with the other apostles and preach and suffer martyrdom eventually uh, in India. Um, they call them the St. Thomas Christians. They're in the southernmost tip of India, which is at this point still the most Catholic part of India is the southernmost uh, tip. The northern regions where the Himalayas is more Buddhist, more uh, Muslim, more Hindu. Uh, but there are Christians, Catholic Christians, Usually they're of the Syro Malabar or Syro Malankar rites. They're not necessarily of the Roman rite. They belong to the Roman church, yes, under the Pope, but they have their own ritualistic uh, style, their own uh, liturgical style. Yes? I just love the way God uses our own personality. He improves us, but yes. he doesn't make us carbon copies. No, he well, we know. Yeah, I mean, he takes all the apostles, I mean, and he's the great nepotist. The apostles are related to each other. Peter and Andrew are brothers. John and James are brothers. Philip and Nathaniel, if they're not brothers, they're cousins or best buddies. Simon and Jude, cousins or brothers. Jo uh, John and James, the younger James, not the older James, but the younger James, who becomes the bishop of Jerusalem, is called the brother of the Lord. So we have this very close-knit group of men who are familiarly related to each other in some sense or other. They're probably neighbors in one other sense. They're all from Northern Galilee, from Bethsaida, from Capernaum, from Cana. So they hung out with each other maybe even before they knew Jesus. They bring Jesus to each other. Andrew brings Peter. Philip brings Nathaniel. John and James were called by the sea. So, I mean, there's a very uh, core group of this, these men form a core group that Jesus molds and shapes, but doesn't really, he doesn't alter who they are. He takes what he has, he molds it and shapes it into something better. With Peter, I mean, God, I mean, come on, Peter. Not the best role model most of the time, but once he gets his act together, he's pretty sharp. But until he gets his act together, He's like, Peter, psh, pull your foot out of your mouth, please, before you choke on your ankles. I mean, the guy has, has very sh strong, uh, impetuous uh, tendencies. But yet Jesus uses those strong, impetuous tendencies to create the leader of the church. He uses the doubting of Thomas to forge an apostle who goes perhaps geographically the furthest of all the apostles. To India. I mean, there was the Silk Road from the Middle East to China, and he could have gone down the Persian Gulf route, maybe take a boat across the Persian Gulf, across the Indian Ocean to India. We don't know how he got there, but he got there somehow. It wasn't impossible to go to those places even back then. 
people did travel by boat and by land, you know, camelback or horseback or wagon or walking or combinations thereof. So yeah, he takes all these human people, these men and women, and he shapes them and molds them and transforms them and makes them into these dynamic apostles who brave death left and right because Jesus is Lord. And that's what they proclaimed. So. Any other questions? Nancy. Alexis is famous. She made such a good statement of how his doubting she said that clicked in my head. I don't know what that happened, but anytime anybody clicked in their head, if you think anytime I have doubt or anytime I have a heck with it or anytime, you know, all these thoughts and questions and I just keep angry and angry and then one day I thought that's how we get our growth. Yeah. If we didn't have the doubts, we we just Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't equivocate um, doubt and despair. They're not the same thing. Um, doubt is a positive action. Um, too much doubt can get you in trouble. But a, a doubt that's based on uh, reality, I mean, I'm always, people say, Oh, the weather forecast. Well, it's called the forecast for a reason. They have all these computer models. I doubt it will rain today. Well, it might rain. It might not rain. That's what it's called the forecast. There's always a possibility of error, plus or minus. Uh, nothing is guaranteed with, with, with things like that. Um, but doubting can be a positive experience because it, it indicates a certain degree of maturity because you're thinking about things and your mind is questioning them. And if the doubts lead to good questioning, as opposed to not so good questioning, it's a good thing. In this case, with Thomas, it's both, you know, he gets chided by the risen Christ. Thomas, come here. And there's this, this almost, almost comical kind of, you know, you really want to really do this? Come on. And he's allowed to touch the risen Christ. He's offered that to the apostles before. Feel me, touch me, I am real. I have skin, flesh, bones. Ghosts don't have these things. That's why they're ghosts. So he's more than willing to accept Thomas's doubt and via that doubt, using the vehicle of his doubt, confirms his faith. And that, that lovely phrase, my Lord and my God, became the traditional prayer when the priests will elevate the host and the chalice at mass. I still hear it said, people will say, my Lord and my God when the host is elevated at Mass. And again, a few minutes later, when the chalice is elevated at Mass, my Lord and my God, that prayer of St. Thomas. Short, sweet, and to the point. My Lord and my God. Can't get better than that. Okay? All right. Well, we've gone through a lot of this already, so. All right, so we're all, we, own, we know where we are. We're up in the upper room, the cynical. More than likely, the house of John Mark, the evangelist. We've heard this before. The doors are locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus comes out of nowhere, stands before them, and says, peace be with you. If anyone was here last Thursday for the Mass with the Bishop for confirmation, at the very beginning of Mass, only a bishop can say this. The priest has to say, the Lord be with you, or one of the other greetings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the fellowship, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Only a bishop can use the greeting of the risen Christ. Peace be with you. So when Bishop uh, Fisher was here last Thursday to confirm, once he came in and stood at the altar, he said the sign of the cross, as always, and then the greeting, short and sweet, to the point, peace be with you. It's right from Scripture, right from John. And after he said, peace be with you, he showed them his hands and his side. Of course, John is famous for having the pierced side. In Luke, as we found out, it's the hands and the 
the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. He is making them apostles par excellence. Now is the moment when all the stuff from the three years we walked together is gone. Now is time for action. As the Father has sent me, so now I in his name send you to preach the gospel to every creature under the sun. And then when Jesus has said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Council of Trent, way back when, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, they define, the bishops under the Pope then, define that this scripture passage from John was one thing, it was the giving of the Holy Spirit and the sacrament of penance. The breathing of Jesus' breath on the disciples, on the apostles, imagine that happening. Here's the risen Christ appearing in this room through locked doors. They're rejoicing. He's given them peace. And he breathes on them. His own very physical exhalation, that carbon dioxide filled breath is the Holy Spirit. Whose lungs are these? The lungs of Jesus. Whose breath is this? It's the breath of Jesus can't get any holier than that. But where else do we see this breath? The Hebrew word, Nancy knows this, is ruah, R-U-A-H or R-U-A-C-H. So ruah or ruach in the Hebrew of God, the breath. It's also wind, it's also spirit. So wind, breath, and spirit. So anytime you hear one of those three words, depending upon the, the context, it's the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, it's a strong driving wind. In Genesis, the Spirit, capital S, hovers over the chaos of creation. Later on in Genesis chapter two, God makes Adam a clay doll, basically, out of the red clay of the earth. He shapes a man. He breathes life into that man, that immortal soul coming directly from God. That's also breathing on the apostles. It's the same word. And the people who read this would know that just by hearing it. The word breath, the ruah or ruah, appears about 400 times, give or take, in the scriptures, mostly in the Old Testament. The Spirit does this. The Spirit rushed on David. The Spirit filled this prophet. The Spirit filled that prophet. The Spirit appears as a dove at the baptism scenes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So this idea of the life-giving Spirit is the same exhalation of breath that John talks about here, being breathed literally on the apostles by Jesus in the upper room. Yes? I was just wondering, so the bishop can only say these three things, so is the reason why we can say it is this the middle of the mass and you know, giving me like when we say the sign of peace, we say peace be with you. But you said the bishop can only say it as a greeting. Well, he only says it as a greeting. Right. As a, as, see, it's a liturgical greeting where the, the priest usually says, the Lord be with you. But when we say, peace be with you, it's not quite the same. Right. Okay. It's a different part of the Mass, right. and it's a preparation for communion. Right. 
so we should be at peace with each other, which of course goes back to, if you're angry with your brother and you bring your gift to the altar, better leave your gift at the altar, run back to your brother, be reconciled with him, and then come back and offer your gift. So that's the idea that we spiritually prepare to receive communion by being at peace with one another. So when I say, you know, peace be with you, it has, doesn't have the same import liturgically as the bishop celebrating mass or the priest even saying, the Lord be with you. I mean, it's, it's a greeting. Good morning is not a liturgical greeting. So it's the Lord be with you or one of the other assigned greetings from the Missal. But no, good question. Okay, anybody else? We okay? So this breathing on the apostles. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. Very similar to what John and Matthew, Matthew has Jesus giving the keys to Peter as Caesarea Philippi. I gave you the keys to heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you condemn on earth will be condemned in heaven. The same idea, the power of the keys uh, to release from sin or not to release from sin. That's key. Um, and there have been times, I think, very rarely would a priest deny someone absolution. You have to be pretty, pretty cantankerous in the confessional for the priest not to give you absolution. And by cantankerous, I mean you have to be like really unrepentant. If, because it's one of the hallmarks of confession, if you're not repentant of your sins, if you're reveling in your sins or you're proud of your sins and you're not going to give them up, well, why you go to confession in the first place? That's kind of silly. But if in the context of confession, you and the priest have this conversation, the priest somehow discerns that you're not quite where you should be, he can sort of move you in that direction um, because this is important. If the priest does not give absolution, you're kind of stuck worse than you were before you entered the confessional. If the priest is not going to give you God's mercy, that's pretty bad. But that's what this refers to, retaining. It's one of the keys. Yes? And what do you say about the priest who does not give absolution? So you go to another priest. You could. Well, that's on the priest. I mean, the priest is, well, you know this, when a priest is doing anything priestly, I don't mean like washing dishes or washing the car or pumping gas, he's doing something priestly. He's like, Father Scott now is hearing confessions or he's celebrating mass or he's anointing someone. He's acting in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. If Father A, does something and the person with Father A doesn't like it and goes to Father B, well then the personality of the priest comes into play and the humanity of the church comes into play. The final arbiter, of course, is God, because God sees into the heart. Whether Father A or Father B is right or not right is irrelevant. Oh, the absolution, the absolution still works. Yeah, the absolution still works, no matter what. There is a, a rule in church law that even the, he, the priest should not do this under any circumstances. But if a priest knowingly celebrates the sacraments in a state of mortal sin, even though he should not do those things, but for some reason finds himself doing them. The sacrament he's celebrating, while he himself is in mortal sin, is still a valid sacrament. The grace of God still works through the sin and the fallibility of the priest. The sin is grave if a priest does do that. 
but it doesn't nullify the fact that he can do that and has the power to do that by orders. Possibly. Personality comes in, yeah. And, and he might have been open to some, some shape of something in this person, and the person who just wasn't. Okay. But if you ever read um, um, Sister Faustina, mm -hmm. she suffered greatly with some of her professors, not understanding her and where she was coming from. That was one of her burdens. And then she finally got, I think, her last professor, mm -hmm. or her last one or two, understood that. Yeah. It's one of those things, the humanity and the divinity of the church is individual per person, per baptized person, ordained person, person in religious life. It doesn't go away. You're still a human being no matter what. But when you're acting in the person of Christ as a priest is in the sacramental uh, act, whether it's confession or mass or anointing, he is acting in the person of Christ. And that doesn't negate the fact that he can have his own opinion or he can have his own, you know, imagination or his own coloration to something being told to him. But the person going to confession who may be denied absolution has the right to go to another priest. And maybe between priest A and priest B has had some conversion the fact that he's going to confession twice, shall we say, means something. Maybe that second priest got that, but the first priest may not have. You must believe it. I mean, there's a conversion happening somewhere. It's not a complete 180 degree conversion, but there's something going on that the priest is trying to uh, work with. And maybe he said it a different way. And that's, yeah. The way you verbalize it is very important. Words mean something. If you come into the confessional and you're all rah, 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 and you get on your high horse and the priest perceives that, whether it's through the grill or through the person to person, then there may be something there that may be not quite so sacramentally needed. Rapsolution could be delayed until further information comes out. But that's the power of the keys, retaining and not retaining sin. Does that make sense? But back, you mentioned St. Faustina. St. Margaret Mary had the same problem with her visions of the Sacred Heart until um, St. Claude de la Colombière became her confessor. And the Sacred Heart, I love this scene, he's appointed uh, the chaplain to the Sisters of the Visitation. And Margaret Mary is there, and she hears this allocution, the voice of Jesus. He's the one. He is my friend. He will help you. And lo and behold, when Margaret Mary went to him and told him what was happening in her life with the revelations of the Sacred Heart, the two of them joined up and got things moving for devotion to the Sacred Heart back in the 1600s. Yeah, I mean. Examine it very carefully. So that we can be sure. Yeah. And not suddenly have to pull back and say, oops, we were wrong. Yeah. Yeah, once you say something is 100% A, plus, and then you wait 10 years and say, ooh, we made a mistake. And going back on it, it's not. So that's why it takes like forever for these things to get approval. Yeah, Again, it's an example of, of the keys. Yeah. And of protecting the deposit of faith. What is to be believed at all times by everyone? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So, Jesus and Thomas, we sort of went over this a little bit already. Remember Mary Magdalene at the tomb? She runs back to Jerusalem and tells the guys, I have seen the Lord. Same phrase here. We have seen the Lord. Thomas, nope, not going to believe it. Sorry. I have to see the nail marks. I have to touch them. Got to put my hand in his side. So God takes him up on the gamble. A week later, so this is the second Sunday after Easter, the disciples are gathered again in the upper room in the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus comes, doors are shut, doors are locked, peace be with you. Then he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. He gives him exactly what he wants. Be careful what you pray for. You might just get it. And get it in a way that you don't expect to get it. Thomas says, I want to put my finger in those nail marks. Jesus says, come on, I dare you. Bring your hand here. Thomas does. How can he, how can he back off now? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. I don't know if in your text it has exclamation point, but it does in, in mine. It's not just Thomas going, oh, my Lord and my God. It's my Lord and my God. There's a certain oomph to his response. It's an act of faith. It's an affirmation of who Jesus is. And the fact that Thomas is able to get this close, get this intimate with him, is really something. But again, Thomas is getting what he asked for. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's everybody who has been around since Thomas made this profession of faith. They did not see the risen Lord and touch him the way Thomas did. That's us. We believe everything that Thomas believed without going through that action of tackling Jesus in the upper room the way Thomas did. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. This is the gospel for the vigil of Pentecost. So if you come to Mass on Saturday evening, this is the gospel you'll hear for the vigil of Pentecost. It's the seventh chapter. Yes? And the second Sunday? And the second Sunday? No, this is different. This is for oh. Pentecost. This is the last gospel will do. So this, is, this, this coming weekend is Pentecost weekend. So there are two different sets of readings for the Vigil Mass and for the Day Mass. This is the gospel for the Vigil Mass. The gospel for the Day Mass is the one of Christ reading of the apostles, receive the Holy Spirit. So that it's, it's, the, it's John's version of Pentecost, where Luke has the, the wind and the fiery tongues and the earthquake and the apostles speaking in tongues and the crowd gathering, that's the public explosion of the spirit that Luke has. In John, it's much more intimate, it's much more um, uh, private. He breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit, no fiery tongues, no driving wind, though the word for breath and wind is the same, remember. There's no shaking of the building. There's no crowd gathering outside wondering what's going on. It's a much different theology between Luke's Pentecost and John's Pentecost. The Spirit is given in both cases, obviously, but the, the way it's done is much, much different. The effect is the same, of course. Yes? So did Thomas have to wait until Pentecost before he received the Spirit since he wasn't there the first time? Perhaps. Or maybe... 
he got close enough, he got a little bit of exhalation, shall we say. I mean, I wouldn't put it past Jesus, because even Jesus takes Paul aside for three years and has a tutorial with St. Paul in the desert after his road to Damascus experience. So I would not be surprised if once Thomas got his act together, as Peter did, he also shared in the gift of the Spirit as one of the apostles and received the same power of the keys to retain and to loose. I mean, we can't negate God's mercy. And the fact that Jesus is allowing him, almost cajoling him with a certain almost comedic charm, Thomas, come on, let's go. There's a sense of, you are asking for this? I'm going to give it to you lavishly. Touch me, feel my fingers, feel your, my, my wrists, my hands. Touch my side with your hand. He's really trying to get Thomas to drop the doubts. And the only way that Thomas will drop the doubts is if he gets his way. So what does Jesus do? He lets him have his way. And that's the beauty of the doubting Thomas. His faith produces this experience that we can share. If Thomas had not done this, things would be a lot more boring, I think. But this is here for our instruction. When we have those doubts, we look to Thomas as our, our, our guide. What did Thomas do when he doubted? He prayed. His prayer was, I want to see those nail marks. I want to see that gash in his side. I want to touch those wounds. Yes? I was going to say, like, do you think he would be embarrassed as well? I mean, if it was me, and here he is, and Jesus shows up, do this, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I should be able to do this. I see the Lord, and I don't know if he would make me touch his fingers, but maybe he would mm -hmm. I should have made it. Like, I would have been very embarrassed. And, okay, I'm sure he was... He was as embarrassed as the other ones were for running away, leaving Jesus high and dry in the garden. Peter leaving him not only high and dry, but denying that he even knew who he was in the garden. Or not the, well, the garden with the, he cut off the guy's ear, but later in the courtyard of the high priest, when Peter is confronted by people who should not be, be able to confront Peter, but are. And so, yeah, so I think mean, all the apostles have room to be embarrassed, room to be ashamed, room to be um, casting their eyes down when Jesus appears. Though this is, they rejoice to have him back in their midst, but I'm sure in the back of their minds there's this little, ooh, I denied him, I ran away, I, um, you know, I you know, hid in the garden behind the rock or whatever. I mean, there's, yeah, there's that there. And I think the denial of Peter, and then later on the rehabilitation of Peter with, you know, Peter, do you love me? Back and forth three times. And the scene here with Thomas, come and put your finger here, your hand here, is a, a healing moment. It's a moment of reconciliation of the risen Christ with his, with his posse, basically, with his apostles. And had these texts not been written, we would be all much more lost without them because they're so rich. When we have our doubts, when we have our moments of, hmm, like Peter did, where we have moments of, of fleeing in the darkness, go back to the scriptures. If Jesus can forgive these folks, he sure as heck can forgive us. Nancy. Oh, yeah, several thousand years. Yeah, I mean, these are... Humanity hasn't changed since Adam and Eve ate that piece of fruit. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's that whole flight and fight. Most people have taken flight. Very few have fought. I mean, what do Adam and Eve do when they realize what they've done? 
they run and hide. They sew fig leaves together. God changes out the fig leaves for leather garments. But what do they do first? They run and hide. When things get dicey in the Garden of Gethsemane, what do the apostles do? Well, they start fighting, at least Peter does. He's told to stop, and they all flee. Last week, we mentioned the naked guy in, Luke's, uh, in Mark's gospel running off without his linen uh, loincloth. So, I mean, flight and fight are with us still. It hasn't changed. The context might change, but the urgency of saving my own skin versus giving up my own skin for a higher cause, the apostles eventually do do that, obviously, but not right away. I often think of the Jews as the vast of monotheism. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we find our finding ourselves in much the same situation. <clears throat> yeah. So we have to experience it. It's not easy. Yeah, I mean, the, the Jewish people, their, their constant fight was uh, idolatry. We have to worship the Egyptian gods. We have to worship the Mesopotamian gods. We have to worship the Sumerian gods. And every time they went off after another god or goddess, then, then Yahweh, the God of Israel, would smack them down. Sometimes quite literally smack them down. Allow them to be invaded, allow them to be taken captive, allow them to be decimated. David and the Philistines, back and forth for, for decades. Every time the children of Israel shifted their allegiance from the God of Israel and his prophets who spoke in his name, they got themselves into trouble we're not much different now. We don't have, well, there are neo-pagans out there. There are people who worship the sun, the moon, the stars, who, you know, have amulets and worship, you know, crystals and do Ouija boards and all kinds of different things. Um, they're still here. They take different shapes and forms and guises than they did 2,000 years ago, but that paganism is still there, and we're surrounded by it still. And that breaks the first commandment. No question. Thou shalt not have any gods before me. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, etc., etc., etc. And God reminds them, I brought you out of Egypt. I freed you from Pharaoh, blah, 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 blah. I gave you the land. I gave you milk, milk and honey. I gave you this. I gave you that. He's constantly, constantly reminding them of what he has done for them and they just said, uh, we liked it back in Egypt. We wanted our melons and our leeks and our fish. This manna sucks. <laughs> it's awful. I mean, they really put God to the test. They quarrel with him every other page in the Old Testament. Literally quarrel with him. And at, at some points, they're basically telling God to go pound sand. If not by words, then certainly by actions. And God shows his mercy usually after he's shown his lack of mercy, in a way, with his punishment, the sire of serpents, biting the people so they die. Moses doesn't even escape unscathed. He gets in trouble. He doesn't go to enter the promised land. He can look at the promised land from a distance, but he can't go in. Yeah, so human nature hasn't changed too terribly much since the day it happened. Exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we go. This is a short, short text. John seven, thirty-seven, thirty-nine. The subtitle is Rivers of Living Water. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there in the temple, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As Scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now, he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was 
no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we're several chapters before John 20, where he's giving the spirit to the apostles with that breathing on them. But the living water, remember also John's gospel and a few chapters previous to this, Jesus is at the well with the Samaritan woman. And what are they talking about almost the whole time? Water. Not water you have to come back for all the time with your bucket, but streams of living water, which echoes the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah, come to the water, come and eat and drink without pain, without cost. It's the same idea here where Jesus is promising the spirit using the metaphor of water for the spirit. So we have these metaphors for the Holy Spirit, wind, air, breath, spirit itself, the capital, the small s. Now we have the equation of the spirit with water. What is baptism? The spirit hovering over the water. We combine the two with the sacrament. John combines the two also on the cross with the blood in the water. In the letter of John, who give witness to Jesus? The blood and the water. Not just blood alone, not just water alone, but both water and blood. John is a masterful theologian, a masterful poet. But who is he pointing to? He's pointing to the risen Christ always. Or the risen Christ is before time, the Logos, the Word, or he's the risen Christ in the cynical having Thomas touch his fingers, touch his side. That's who John's pointing to. And that's the really the important aspect of our faith. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all point in different ways to Jesus very different ways, very different ways. But yet, Jesus is unique in the sense he is both the message and the messenger. No one else can say that. When we first began tonight, we talked about the Greek gods and the Roman gods. They would do all kinds of crazy things, but never would one of them do what Jesus has done. rise from the dead and give his disciples, his followers, everlasting life. That is our legacy as Christians. And the apostles, the evangelists, give us the words, give us the symbols, give us the contexts so we can follow. It's the blueprint. It's the roadmap. Does that make sense? Well, that is it. Any other questions, concerns? Brother, yes. When Jesus ascended to heaven, did he still have wounds? Of course. Okay. Because he would have the wounds forever. He still has them. Um, remember, we talked once or twice, or probably more than that, that the risen body of Christ is the same body he had from, from Mary. Of course, the body of Jesus was derived purely from Mary. It's all from her. Joseph had nothing to do with it, as you all know. It's all his, his entire humanity, 100% DNA, chromosomes, it's all Mary, it's all on her. That body that she bore, gave birth to, nursed, nurtured, that Joseph taught carpentry to, was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead, appeared to the apostles, breathed on the apostles, all those things we've been talking about this last several weeks, is the same body that was taken up into heaven, and the same body that appears in all these apparitions. Yes? So when Jesus was dying, he said, all the graves were open, and everybody goes to the dead. That was the real bodies? Were they glorified, or were they ghosts? It says their bodies were raised. In Matthew, the tombs were open and they walked into the, they walked into the city 
and appear to many people in Matthew. Yeah. Yes. Except for Mary. Yes. So they were raised, but there wasn't really the body. It wasn't. It wasn't a, not the permanent resurrection. Ah. It's kind of hard because only Matthew has that, and it's part of Matthew's um, technique of showing that at this moment of the death of Jesus, everything gets turned upside down. The dead are raised. The sky is darkened. The full moon is being eclipsed. You can't eclipse a full moon. It's, it's impossible unless you're God. So it's his way of saying, okay, people, this is important. I am the resurrection and the life. So people who have died are being raised, walking into the city and appearing to people. Do they do that forever? Do they go back to their tombs? It doesn't say but it does indicate a certain catastrophic reaction to this death. Well, the, temple the temple curtain is torn. Now this curtain was not like a piece of paper you could just shred with one hand. It was a thick, heavy curtain. It was meant to block visual access to the Holy of Holies, which of course at that point was empty. There was no Ark of the Covenant. But this curtain was torn from top to bottom. It was not a small feat. No human hand could have done that. So maybe these people that were just not maybe they could have died. Possibly. Or maybe yeah, it doesn't say. Sense. But right. again, it, it, it points to the fact that this is something really, this is traumatic. Right. It's, a, it's both traumatic, it's catastrophic, and you catastrophic at the same time. It's good news and bad news. Okay. For those who believe, it's wonderful news. For those who don't, oh boy, we're in trouble. The hour is past, but let us conclude with a prayer. Uh, where did I put it? It's in the back. Okay. Let us pray. This is the prayer for today's feast day of the visitation. Almighty, ever-living God, who while the Blessed Virgin Mary was carrying her son in her womb, inspired her to visit Elizabeth, grant us, we pray, that faithful to the promptings of the Spirit, we may magnify your greatness with the Virgin Mary at all times. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Let us bless the Lord and give him thanks. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.